Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 1 in our study of the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament is divided into uh, 39 books, the 39 books of the Old Testament, and 27 books in the New Testament, giving us a total of 66 books. If you can remember that, then you can remember a basic outline for the book of Isaiah, which also is divided into two major sections. We're going to subdivide it in just a moment. Uh, But the the first 39 chapters deal with judgment, and then the last 27 chapters deal with the subject of comfort. So in a sense, you can almost look at Isaiah as as a miniature of the Bible itself. But if I, if I can subdivide it just a little further, here's our overview of Isaiah. The first 35 chapters, chapters 1 through 35, have judgments in the present. And then chapters 36 and 39 still have that judgment theme, but it's given in the form of a historical interlude. And there's some history that's taking place. Actually, uh, that's taking place almost word for word from the pages of Second Kings. We'll look maybe in another, another talk at that intervening area. And then chapters 40 through 66 are the glory of the future. So again, with this judgment theme, we see the judgment of God, uh, chapters 1 through 39. And then the comfort of God. So judgment and comfort, the comfort of God being chapters 40 through 66. Now, when we come to chapter 1 of Isaiah, we see the same pattern where verses 1 through through 20 of of Isaiah chapter 1 is judgment in the present. Again, there's going to be a descriptive, maybe not historical, but a, a descriptive interlude. And then verses 24 through 31, giving glory in the future. So again, we have the judgment of God, verses 1 through 23 and then the comfort of God, which means that Isaiah chapter 1 is a microcosm of the entire book of Isaiah. And so let's dig in. Chapter 1, verse 1, in the uh, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. By this time, Israel was no more. Let's let's look at a cross-section of the historical background of this book. Here's a chart that we're going to see. And notice uh, that that center row, I've got, just got a listing of the kings, uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh also, although he's not mentioned here, um, Manasseh, it's believed, it was a king when Isaiah was still alive and still ministering. And notice uh, the the lines aren't always clear-cut. Sometimes I've got them a little jagged. And what that is showing is that some of these kings actually served as regents for their father while their father was still alive. Um, Notice at the top bar, you talk about the northern kingdom coming to an end. The year 721 B.C. was when the northern kingdom ceased to exist. And the reason it ceased to exist is because the nation of Assyria had come down against them and taken the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity, leaving the southern kingdom still there and still facing the onslaught of Assyria. And we're going to see that in uh, some other chapters where that's actually going to be described. Meanwhile, notice I have the ministry of Isaiah, but I also have him as a contemporary with some other prophets. So notice going from left to right, we have Amos and the ministry of Hosea and the ministry of Micah. And then far to the right, we have Nahum. Uh, Of course, Nahum is prophesying about Assyria and about how it's going to, the, the nation of Assyria is going to fall. Now you say, well, why don't we look at the prophets, um, in, in a more, in a more chronological way? And, and I'm sure there are some studies that have done that. But as I'm going to be approaching the prophets, I'm going to be really looking at it just in the order that we have in our English Bible. And so right now we're looking at at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2 begins, Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. And of course, when you're hearing the the opening verse of, uh, of Isaiah, it brings to mind the creation account. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he says, listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth. But also, it brings to mind something that you read about in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1, where Moses says, give ear, O heavens, and let me speak, and let the earth 
here are the words of my mouth. And, and um, you say, well, that's Moses, but it, it's actually Moses speaking on behalf of God, and it's God who's doing the speaking there. And here, even though Isaiah is speaking, um, he's going to be speaking that which God has given him. And so God speaks, notice the Lord speaks, and here's what God has to say. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. And then, uh, it's an interesting uh, mixing of metaphors. Uh, I I brought up sons who have revolted, verse 3, an ox knows his owner, a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. My people have not the sense have not the withitness of an ox or a donkey, which know who their master is, but my people have forgotten who their master is to be. Verse 4 says, Alas, sinful nation, people weigh down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers. Now, when it says offspring of evildoers, literally, that's seed of the evil ones. And think about, about how that takes you back to Genesis, where you, you talk about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And here's the seed of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. So notice Israel is described as a sinful nation, people who have turned away from him. Verse 5, where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head, and and what what begins here in the middle of verse 5, is Israel being described in terms of a body. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's, there's nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, not softened with oil. And this body is in very sad shape as it has rebelled against the Lord. Verse 7, your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields, strangers are devouring them in your presence. It is desolation as overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. And so it's speaking about Israel, but but. Remember, Israel is taken into captivity in the book of Isaiah. So it's Israel in the spiritual sense, but also Judah. Because not you see, when the northern kingdom of Israel was carried away, Judah was left behind, and Judah would be desolate as well, because the Assyrians could come up against the kingdom of Judah as well. And when it speaks in verse 8, the daughter of Zion, that's not just the northern kingdom of Israel. That's also the southern kingdom of Judah. That's Jerusalem. Verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left us a few survivors, we would be like Sodom. We would be like Gomorrah. We would have been completely destroyed. And now he says, verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. He's speaking of those who are supposed to be God's people, and he's calling them Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because they have acted like Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and there's a warning there. Uh, don't be like Sodom and Gomorrah, or else you you will end up being treated like, and, and you're, you're experiencing that right now, the judgment of God. Verse 11, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls lambs or goats. And, and you can imagine people saying, wait a minute, we've got a temple. We've been, we've been worshiping you. We've been bringing your sacrifices. Uh, you know, haven't you enjoyed your meals that we've brought to you, Lord? You know, as if though, as if God was a, like one of these pagan gods that, that eats the sacrifices and, and, and he needs those to survive on. And he says, no, no. And, and God's not saying that the sacrifices are bad. After all, he's the one who instituted them. But there's something more important that his people have neglected. And so, verse 12, 
And notice how he says this, when you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? You know, you, you come bringing your, your sacrifice and your offerings. Verse 13, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. You've been coming to do your religious thing, but you've been neglecting that which was of greater importance. You say, well, what's more, what's more greater importance than serving the Lord through his, the rituals that he has designed, through the offerings that he has mandated, through the observances that he has called, things like the new moon and the Sabbath? Verse 14, I hate your new moon festival and your appointed feast. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of burying them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes. I'm going to shut my eyes to you when you come to worship. Yes, even though you, you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Why? Because your hands are covered with blood. Verse 16, and so he calls himself now. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. They had they had been doing outward things, outward rituals, but they had neglected those things of the heart, those those things of real justice, of real worship, of real sanctification of of real work toward God. Verse 18, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. There is hope. There is hope for a turning to the Lord and a conversion that goes more than skin deep, that goes all through and through. Verse 19, if you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's a call. There's a call to come back, a call to repentance, a call to return to him, to stop this rebellion. Are you going to heed the call? Now notice <laughs> The, the referencing to eat. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured. And, and the Hebrew actually has exactly the same word for eating. You will be eaten by the sword. And so literally, you will be eaten. Are you going to eat? Or are you going to be eaten? Now, what we see here is the judgments in the past. What, what, now we come to verse 21, where we, we're going to have not really historical, but a descriptive interlude. And so verse 21, here's a description of the city, how the faithful city, well, what's the faithful city? This was Jerusalem. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She has prostituted herself. She who was full of justice, righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. And it's not necessarily talking about physical murder, although that could be true too. But a, a spiritual murder in the way she has treated the poor, the helpless, the destitute, she has become a harlot. You know, when you get to the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, there's this picture of Jerusalem the way it's supposed to be, but also there's this picture of a harlot, of Babylon the harlot. And, and when you look at that picture, there's, there's a sense in which you, you can't help but see Jerusalem, who has prostituted herself, who has, who has joined in league with Rome in order to put to death her Savior. And that imagery comes from here in Isaiah 1, as, as well as from other passages in the Old Testament. And notice, the faithful said, city, she, has, she who is full of justice, because the, uh, it's, that, it's that, that woman imagery, righteousness once lodged in her, but now murders. And I want you to see this. I point it out here because it's going to continue in the next few verses. Verse 22, your silver, and you can't see this from our English text, but in Hebrew, because pronouns in Hebrew are, are, are part of the, the word that they're governing, and they contain 
they contain gender. So it's your silver, but it's your feminine. Still speaking of, of the city. Your silver has become dross. Your drink diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels. And, and in all that, that, each one is the feminine singular. And companions of thieves, everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan, nor does the widow's plea come before them. You see, they've been ignoring the helpless. They've actually been taking advantage of the helpless in order to, to gain wealth, to gain riches. And what Isaiah is underscoring here is what we would call so, social justice. And so you have that descriptive interlude, and then verse 24 through 31, we're going to get a glimpse of glory in the future. Remember, we, we've we been seeing the judgment of God, but now for, for the first time, we see the comfort of God. And so verse 24, therefore the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel declares, ah, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. God's going to win. I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye and will remove all your alloy. I'm going to move some, remove, I'm going to do some removing. And notice against you, it's, it's still that feminine. It's still speaking to Jerusalem uh, as I, my hand comes against you and smelt away your dross and remove your alloy. And, and we still have this feminine singular that's taking place. Verse 26, then, and here's the hope, then I will restore your judges as at the first. When I, when I get rid of that, that glit and that glamour and that, those things that are actually uh, condemnation against you, then I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called not a, not a city that's a, a prostituted city, not a, a, a harlotry city, but after that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. You know, you see the same thing, by the way, in the, in the book of Revelation, where there's this picture of, of the harlot Babylon, and you, you turn the page, and, and all of a sudden the scene changes. And there's the faithful city. There's the bride. And it brings you to the new Jerusalem coming, coming like a bride or, or uh, a bride who's been ordered for her husband. And that's what we see here. After that, you'll be called the city of righteousness a faithful city. Verse 27, Zion will be redeemed with justice. Remember, Zion is another another word name for Jerusalem. And her repentant ones with righteousness. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together, and those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. And so there's, there's a dividing between those who are faithful, and they are redeemed, and, and those who aren't part of this, and they come to an end. Verse 29, surely you will be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired. Now, oaks, uh, make that's a, that's a reference to the pagan worship uh, and, and some of the, the things that people had, had gone off to the high places and the oak trees and, and the gardens. And you'll be embarrassed at the gardens which you have chosen, for you will be like an oak whose leaf fades away, or as a garden that has no water. Verse 31, the strong man will become tender, his work also a spark. Thus they shall both burn together and there will be no one to quench them. And so what you have, I think you have the gospel here. You see, our story is found here. Our story is found that apart from Christ, we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God and we've all come under God's judgment and apart from him, we find a story of judgment. But then Jesus came. And he came in history to live the life we should have lived and to die the death that we deserve to die. And if we trust in him, we look back at what he accomplished on our behalf, and now we trust in him. We find that we have gone from death to life. We have gone from judgment to comfort. But there's a warning that that only works if we come in faith to him and we cease being our own strong man, because that will only bring judgment. We humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord as we trust in him as our Lord, as our Savior, a Savior who saves, 
And there we find redemption, there we find comfort, there we find salvation.